G'day, Chris here and welcome back to ClickSpring. There are many carefully made components within the Antikythera mechanism. The fastening pins, for example, need to be well formed to fit snugly within their respective holes. It's the sort of work that's most conveniently done by hand on something like a filing block. Quite precise results are possible with this simple approach, using a file, a notch in some wood and maybe some abrasive stones. The nature of the pins suits this freehand approach. Some variability in the form is not only tolerable, but occasionally it might even be beneficial to the end result. For some of the other components, the requirements are stricter. The mechanism's complex gear train is completely intolerant of friction. Its many arbors and pivots requiring true cylindrical shapes to avoid binding. The hand fold approach is mostly not suitable. So, if not essential, then at the very least, a lathe of some sort would certainly have been a useful part of the tool suite used to construct the mechanism. We have clear reference to lathe technology in the surviving literature from the period, as well as a depiction of an obvious progenitor. We also have a lot of turning debris and artefacts. But to date, little remains of the actual tools themselves. There's a distinct gap in our practical knowledge of the lathe technology used to construct the Antikythera mechanism. So, what was the likely form of that lathe? And what was it like to use it to create functioning components for the device? In one of the previous videos in this series, describing a scorper and trammel, I showed that the large circular shapes found in the mechanism can be cut with precision using a simple tool, consistent with the metalworking technology of the time. So this leaves only the formation of the small round components, like the arbors, shafts and bearings, to be explained. They're generally fairly short and thin, so we're already talking about a relatively small tool. The size of the parts also means that we can rule out any requirement for a pole-driven mechanism. A hand-operated bow will provide more than enough driving power. The tool must be able to produce well-finished bearing surfaces to close tolerances, and the operator needs to be able to get physically close to the work to be able to see it well enough to assess progress, all of which suggests a tool on the scale of something like this. In my case, I've let the prongs into a piece of wood that I can then hold in this work holding device. But they could just as easily be let directly into the bench, or put in some sort of standalone frame. The key feature is the opposing points, between which the work is caused to rotate. For the bow, I've used a thin springy length of wood. I've formed a notch at each end in preparation for stringing the bow with a natural gut line. The tool now has a reasonably ergonomic form. It's at a convenient eye level for work from a standing position. And once the bow is wound around the workpiece, a full draw will end at a normal relaxed arm extension. A cutting tool rest need be nothing more than a piece of wood or even strips of leather underneath or adjacent to the work axis. I found it helpful to use a few drops of wax it holds things in place and still allows the rest to be pushed into just the right position whenever needed. The cutting tools are another example of the carburised iron cutting tools that I've been using at various points in the construction of the mechanism. Each lathe cutter has been forged and then carburised using the leather charcoal and salt carbon pack described in a previous video. Once tempered, the cutting edges are brought up and then continuously maintained as the work progresses using abrasive stones. OK, so let's have a look at what the tool can do with a piece of wood. I'm using ebony as a test piece, a wood recorded as being used in the furniture construction of the time. 
A light trim with a chisel gives a slightly better starting point for the first lathe cuts, and two light punch marks are put in place to catch the centres. A key feature of the lathe is that the two prongs are lightly sprung when a workpiece is loaded in between, providing the closing force that holds it in place. It's convenient to load and then unload the lathe. A small twist and the work pops out. Reverse the move and it's back in place again. If the workpiece is a little too long or short for the prong spacing, the next hole along can be used. And at any position, the prongs can be slightly bent in or out to modify the closing force. The first cuts are interrupted and so a little coarse to begin with. But the great attribute of the lathe is its ability to bootstrap itself into a more capable state. After a light notching cut at one end, the work can be repeatedly flipped end for end, gradually improving the surface gripped by the bowline. The line grip is improved further still by applying a small amount of rosin to the line, a material that I've used in a previous video showing its potential role at the time as a soft solder flux. Okay, so with a smooth direct drive and a reliable grip from the line, some real work can begin. In this case, I'm going for a general reduction of the workpiece and a thin, lightly tapered arbor on one end. The work is now close to being a suitable diameter upon which to mount a metal workpiece using a friction fit. Generally speaking, raw metal stock is likely to have been cast, forged and then filed into a basic starting form. From there, additional starting features, like for example an internal bore, can be completed using the pump drill and hand files as required.
Once close to size, both the arbor and workpiece can be carefully adjusted and then pressed together for more turning. So fairly quickly we end up with another potential upgrade of the tool. The bearing parts are filed as required for a snug fit, as well as a suitable position of the pulley relative to the pivot point. Then once pressed together the pulley is captured, making sure to leave a little end shake for free movement. So now in addition to the direct drive method shown previously, we now also have an indirect alternative that can be used, depending on the workpiece requirements. In each case, catching the driving force however best suits the occasion, while still making use of the core features of the bow lathe. Two pivots, a rotational force, a tool rest and a cutter. An occasional spot of olive oil on the bearing points helps to keep things moving and the cutting progresses in a way that will be familiar to modern clock and watchmakers because this is basically a crude version of a watchmaker's turns. The lathe technology used to build the first mechanical clocks and watches and a precursor of much of what was to come. During the time of the mechanism's construction, this early version of machine technology must surely have been quite something to witness. Our understanding today is that while its origins are not precisely known, it's likely that the art of constructing this type of mechanism was practiced on the island of Rhodes. A naval and trading power in its own right, and a key stopping point for merchants in the eastern Mediterranean. Rhodes interacted deeply with the Greeks, Romans, Egyptians and other powers of the region. Yet ultimately Rhodes would become established much like Alexandria in Egypt as a centre of science and technology, where those with the means such as Roman nobility would attend at schools and personal lectures given by well-regarded scholars. 
Among those scholars were some of the most famous names of ancient astronomy, mathematics, engineering and philosophy. Individuals like Geminus, the author of an influential student text on astronomy, the introduction to the phenomena. Hipparchus, whose astronomical theories appear to underpin several features designed into the mechanism. And Posidonius, the Stoic philosopher and polymath, who was said by Cicero to have constructed a similar type of device. The passing references by Cicero and others to devices and technology that sound similar to the mechanism recovered off the coast of Antikythera lack the detail to tell us much more than that they existed. So today we're left to wonder about the specifics of where, by who and precisely how this art form was practiced. The mechanism itself providing just enough detail to keep us thinking, asking questions and imagining the possible answers. The bow lathe is a straightforward tool to make using the tools and materials of the time. And it's able to produce all of the turned complexity exhibited in the wreckage of the Antikythera mechanism. It's also one of the simplest ways to implement an intrinsic property of our world, where a body spun between two points can have its profile shaped true to its axis and so be transformed into something meaningful. From this key principle, Everything else follows. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.